Welcome, everybody. This is Mark Cuban. I'm not going to say we're not Shark Tank. You're his favorite member of the basketball team. You're his favorite. You're his favorite everything. You're right. We will talk about it. Good job. All right. Cost cluster. Here we go. Um, sorry, cost cluster. I got a cold email from Radio Al with Dr. Al Dr. Fancy. And he wanted to do some compounding parts to reduce cost of generic drug. I'm like, you are thinking too small. And so what we with him, we created a platform, a, a website called CostCrossDrugs.com. And the premise basically is really simple. Nobody here likes the healthcare system. Nobody here looks, you know, think about the process when you get a um, prescription at the doctor. It's, okay, Mark, you need this. And they don't, they don't talk about, okay, what can you afford? They don't talk about, you know, what's the best way to pay for it. It's just, what pharmacy do you use? And then you go to the pharmacy. And if you've got good insurance, right, your company does a good job for you, you're like, okay, I'm set, whatever. But if you don't, or if you don't have any insurance at all, or your coke day is high, you go to the pharmacy and you get that moment of fear where it's like, how much this shit gonna cost? And you realize you've got to make a decision. And we've all been to the pharmacy where we've seen somebody else. You can't afford the medication either. You know, senior citizen or somebody, and they're just, they look at it, they have to turn around. And we, you know, we've all seen the research and said, you know, that 40 whatever percentage of people have to make choices between rent, food, daycare, etc. And their medication, and often they'll forego their medication. So when we started CostPlusDrugs.com, we decided that the thing that was missing was cost. And the answer was transparency. So when you go to costplusdrugs.com and you put in the name of your medication, we care about 2400, don't carry all 5,000, we're working on the rest. But we care about 2400, you put it in there, the first thing that comes up is the name information, then you see how it costs. You know exactly what we pay for at costplusdrugs.com. We mark it up 15%, and if you do a mail order, there's a shipping fee and a pharmacy fee that for you because the local pharmacy is better. They're affiliated with us. And lo and behold, our prices were cheaper than pretty much everybody. And so we started to be January 19th of 2022. And now we have billions of customers. And I'll give you some examples of the impact that we've had. There's a drug called a path, chemotherapy. And if you just walk into your local, you know, big name pharmacy with a um, without concern. There's a good chance they're going to charge you $2,000 a month. Depending on the strength, our price will be $21 to $41. I got a call from a friend that I went to Indiana with, and um, he was like, Mark, I want my insurance. I need to get into the floor with a car wreck, and he needed a drug called Troxnova. I had no idea what that was. He's like, so they're going to charge me $10,000 every three months. I'm like, let me see if, if we can do something for us. Yeah, we got a course of $30 a month. And it's just insane the way prescriptions, medications are priced these days. There's so many inconsistencies, there's so many uh, problems with it. Um, and what we did was we just added transparency. So that now, hopefully, all of you will go, if you have any medication, now you might be thinking yourself, well, I have good insurance. If you have insurance, you probably have a copay. And if you have a copay, you're probably paying for the city work for 10, 15, 20 dollars at any time. There's a really good chance we're cheaper than your copay. <laughs> and that's kind of the other thing they also cost plus drugs. Because what's happening now in healthcare, as an entrepreneur, I can tell you that for my companies, we have using the healthcare terminology about a thousand lines across my country. And meaning we're sure a thousand people. And the reality was before we started cost plus drugs, I had no idea how my own care was priced. I had my buddy who did our benefits consulting, and he told me it was a great deal. And then I started going through this shit. He was charging me, my buddy, was charging me $30 for an employee per month just to give us help. The insurance company was charging me $25,000, $29,000 for a family of five. And so I'm not going to go too deep into the week because there's a lot of things we want to talk about. But the message I want to leave you is 
whether you're an employer, an entrepreneur, someone who has insurance or don't have insurance, go to costbucksworks.com and price this out. Because there's a really, really good chance on it where yourself, your employees, your friends, your family, we're going to be able to save you money. It may not be a lot, may be a lot, depending on what you take. And there may be somebody you know whose life depends on being able to afford their medication. And we're here to help those people. So give it to Mr. Oh, that was really deep. You're leaving Shark Tank, why? Um, <laughs> I got one more year, first of all. And 15 years is enough, right? Um, I love the show. I love what it stands for. I love the fact that, you know, kids come, 20 year old kids come up to me and say, oh yeah, I grew up watching you with Shark Tank. I'm like, thanks, motherfucker. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, my kids are teenagers now, and we shoot to June and September. September's fine because they're back at school, but June's when they're out of school. And, you know, now one's in college and our schedules don't fall the line. They're older. It used to be I could tell them what to do. My wife and I could tell them what to do over the summer. Now they try to tell me what to do and they're typically successful. And so while they're still close to the house and dependent on me at some level, I might be able to spend more time with them. So that's, that's all the reason. Well, that, that's acceptable. We're going to miss you because you're the best part of that show. I, I know. I know. <laughs> all right. From, the, uh, from there, You've been on social media more than usual the last few days. Uh, well, first of all, let me just say this. Social media is no longer no longer the social is the wrong word to describe the application that we use to communicate. Yes. There is nothing social about X slash Twitter. Even Instagram, right? We, you know, you name it. Are there any really any applications that are truly social anymore? Is there anyone who's posting? You know, they used to join every night. Who wants to talk to myself? What's going on? Where are the parties at? Oh, and you'd like use Twitter to meet people. Oh, I just met this really cool person and we're talking about this and this and this. Does that happen anymore? What's that? What's that? I don't know. That's what I do. Hey, will you buy this or I have this? No, I don't. Yeah. But I'm not taking it anything away from that. You seem like a very nice person. That's I, right. Yeah, right. <laughs> right. Hey, are you over 18? <laughs> well, it isn't very social, so let's just say media. When you've been on the platform, you've been social platforms. You have definitely been posting on social platforms. Yes, you have. Uh, you know, with super maybe richest person on earth. And uh, not necessarily having the best combo. Discuss. <laughs> Discuss. Well, from you, your point of view, I like to talk about them. <laughs> I mean, look, Twitter is not an easy business to run. I give all the credit in the world. He put his money where his mouth is. He gets people in every damn well that he gives with the platform. It is his And, you know, do I think, would I do the same way? Uh, do I think it has? That's a theme, by the way. I'm just saying, Linda said that yesterday, but I didn't say it. But that's interesting to tell me about blending right here. Oh, shit. No, that protects me. But, um, and so, knowing what it is, and knowing that there's some things that I agree with people on, some things I don't, I just prefer to, to say things that I know most people are going to disagree with me on. Right? So I started talking about BDI's first day of inclusion, and I said how I use it in my own company. I did, you know, try to, to you know, preach, or I didn't try to, you know, convert anybody, I didn't try to, you know, tell somebody this is what you need to do. By the way, Mark, just for people who have to follow this, you should probably just talk about what your position actually is on DEI for once. Oh, I think DEI is great for business, right? I think, you know, your company, you want to put yourself in a position to succeed with your stakeholders. And like in the Dallas Mavericks, we have a very diverse community of fans who buy tickets and advertising and everything. And I want the people in my company to to relate, to be able to relate more closely. Look, we, everybody in the planet relates better, or at least more comfortably, to people who are like us, right? It may be, hey, when you're Jewish, people talk about MOT. Yeah, what yeah. MOT is? Members of the tribe. I mean, unless you're, if you're, you know, Japanese, if you're, you know, Greek, 
into your whatever it is. Everybody has a connection that they, they feel confident in that opens the door to talk. And I think that's an important role in business as well. And I like the idea of having a more diverse workforce because I think it engenders ideas and different schools of thought. And I don't need people who look like me. I need people who are different than me. Right? It's easy to find people like me who are, you know, um, but it's hard to find diverse opinions. But I knew when I said that, and I effectively wrote that, that people were going to start associating DEI with quotas. And that there was going to be the reverse effect where the presumption is if you use DEI, you hire people who are less qualified. And I knew that's what the response would be on text. And so I went for it because that's exactly what I, I just wanted to confirm my bias, if you will. Um, and that's what happened. And, you know, and there were people who would promote these stats and those stats and they felt supported their opinion. I'm like, you know, you don't understand. Just because you hire somebody that doesn't look like you, that does not mean you're less qualified. It just means we just expanded our um, reach of applicants and it just happens to have to be the most qualified person. They're like, well, you're hiring people who are less qualified, and that's why you do this, because you want, you want to purchase the signal. That was a big one. You want to purchase it. I'm like, fuck no, I want to make more money, right? And it's just like, to me, this is what a good business does. You don't need more people like you. You need people who complement your skill sets. And so, long story short, I got all the normal suspects jumping on me and everybody, you know, trying to take snippets of things I've said, you know, over my business career and trying to use that against me and whatever. And then Elon, Elon pops in and, you know, with Elon, there's one word in response. What did he say? I don't want to say it. <laughs> no, I don't want to say it. <laughs> so you say it. No, you say it. It's your song. No, you say it. You see the tweet is here. And you see what he says? Did you say it? No. <laughs> <laughs> Starts with an R and ends with a T. I don't know. I'm not saying it. I'm just not allowed to say it. It's like these PR words. No, they don't be a racist, right? And a liar. And so I'm like, were you a racist or a liar? No, I said it. Yeah, I, I don't think so, anyways. Uh, I mean, we all have our things that we, we need to get better at, but no, I don't think I am. And so, um, I did the only thing a sensible person would do on, on X. I blocked them. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's the end of it. I didn't realize you were the best really time. Oh, yeah. The only person who would really know is him. That just made me laugh. <laughs> <laughs> That's the end of the video. Yeah. 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 You have a pretty strong opinion about the upcoming political campaign for President of the United States. Do you want to talk about that? <laughs> what I do. Well, according to the, I, mean, I didn't watch him on Twitter. Yes. Yeah, oh, no. I basically, I mean, look, it depends on who. I don't think it, 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 the foregone conclusion who the candidate are, first of all. And so, um, you know, I like the process. I, you know, I haven't really said a whole lot politically other than. Um, what did I say? I said that just about the whole immunity thing, right, that Trump was talking about that, you know, I thought that it would be appropriate for the current president to say, well, look, if, you know, Donald Trump gets immunity, then I'm going to use that to the full extent capable, and, you know, I'm never leaving. And so, I, you know, I just, again, I like to tweet, you know, tweet people on X, and so, you know, that was what I said. But generally, about politics, it, you know, it's interesting. As an entrepreneur, I always look for an edge somewhere. And what's interesting to me right now is there are 17 open primary states. And within the state of Iowa, as an example, you know, just to get a two minute search, you can go, if, you, if anybody here happens to live in Iowa, um, you can just go register as a Republican the day of the, um, the election and go vote for anybody with Trump. Well, that, that is great. And so then I looked up um, the 2016 election last time it was competitive, and Ted Cruz, who won, only got 61,000 votes. And I was in a caucus environment, right? So that changes some of the, the gameplay. But um, how cool would it be if all those people who don't like that guy, and or even vice versa, if you do like him, right, just went in there and changed how the election turned out, the primary turned out? I know in the state of Texas, 
I'm, I'm an independent. I'm not registered either way. I'm going to go and vote in the Republican primary. I don't know who I'm going to vote for yet, but I'm going to vote in the Republican primary because cross voting is part of the rules. And as long as you play by the rules, there's a chance for everybody to actually influence the outcome of the primary. And so we see all these polls, but the polls only talk to registered voter voters within that primary um, part of the pressure. They don't consider cross voting at all. And so when we say who the candidates are going to be, I still think it's open. But I can tell any of you who want to have an impact, vote. And it doesn't matter if you're an independent, if you're in one of these 17 states or where you get registered the day of. Oh. Yeah. And that doesn't impact who you will vote for in the general election. You still get to vote for who you want. So if you were in Iowa and you registered and you're an independent and you register as a Republican and you vote for Nikki Haley, um, she, even if she doesn't win, you change the balance of, right? Because people look at the numbers and that creates a perception. For me in Texas, it's going to be really hard for my single vote to impact the Republican primary in Texas. But if I'm one of any, you know what happens. And so we're in a very unique time right now where individual citizens doesn't matter what party you belong to because there's so many states where you can choose what party, what primaries you're voting. And the thing about primaries is so few people vote. The extreme voters are the ones that have the most impact, the ones with the most extreme positions. And I think this is the opportunity to change all that. So everybody needs to vote in the primary where you think you can have the greatest impact. You know, I would tell you that two things I'll let you choose. One, your investable thesis for 2024 beyond based on the world we live in. Two, AI, take your investable thesis for 2024 the world we live in. I mean, I don't know. And, and so interest rates are high enough now, I should put my money in the market to buy Okay, well, I'm a lucky motherfucker, so that's still a lot of money. But, um, but even, you know, like for my kids, I'm like, okay, put a little bit in a long term fund, just let it, you know, they're 14, 17, and 20. But for the most part, take your 5, 4, 3, 11 percent, chill, you know, because that's real money and you can sleep well at night. Um, and in terms of AI investable thesis, I think it's going to be really, really hard to invest in AI right now because. You saw what happened to a lot of the wraparound co companies, those have kind of been blown up. Um, you always have to know the difference between a feature and a product. And knowing what the products are in AI is very difficult. We looked at OpenAI, we looked at Alpha, we look at open source, and these you know, primary, you know, big five or whatever it is, products that are going to define and dominate. I don't think necessarily that that's the case. I literally think there's going to be billions of LLM models that will be distributed throughout the world. So your company will have its own model. You might use open source as a foundation. You might use another third party, and then you build on that to build your own. I think each person will get to the point where I'm going to be able, like, I've, I've had emails from 1995, it's the same. Um, and being able to adjust those into my own large language model, and everything you know, I've written and said, and all that stuff, I mean, taking this speech and adjusting it, I'll never die, right? Because we all are great telling you, each other going to be asking me questions. You think I'm kidding? I'm not. It is going to be so fucking insane, right? Because the math, like, my, my kids text more than they email. I try to tell them, like, text, you know, is more ephemeral. It, it, you don't keep those as long. But email can live forever. And being able to adjust those, think about it. If you're 25 or 30, 35 year old, years old now, and you keep every email that you ever get or sent, and all the text and all the things you write for work or personal or whatever it may be, and you keep them all and you put them into a large language model. And those large language models get more efficient and smarter over time. You literally, and then you take, I have a company called Hypervision, and they literally do um, um, big, Avatar type stuff, and it's insane how they can, you can take the output of a large language model and have it look like I'm talking. Right? You think of the Michael Jackson concerts and everything were cool? No, you can take an individual and then feed the output to questions on the large language model. And they're all only going to get smarter. 
Each and every one of us, this is going to be insane. By the way, right now, today, if you have a chat to be taken out of the paper, there's a number of cheesy free of the actual thing you choose to get involved And you say to it in your prompt, your acting is Mark Cuban. <laughs> and you ask it to speak in Mark's voice. It actually does a very credible job of, you know, saying, motherfucker. Mm. <laughs> so, very good. They came to be in life with that moment. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But firstly, with, with AI, right, I, I've been through a lot of technological revolutions where things change everything, right? And it always goes further than you expect, but it just takes a little bit longer. And without question, AI will be the most impactful. Now, do I expect Terminator and all that stuff? I think it will be some things that are close. Right, and that'll be scary, and if the, the military are, will scare the shit out of us. But I don't, I'm not one of those fatalists who thinks things are going to get really, really bad and go out, think us, and take all of our jobs. No. But I do think you'll be able to use it as a resource on your own. And that's where the really cool stuff will happen. Because how we use it within our lives, using just like the example that I gave you, is going to be really, I mean, if, if you're going to have a kid, let's say five years from now, instead of just giving them the iPad like you might now when they get hopefully three, four, five, maybe a little, a little older, you're going to start having it, your AI model learn from your little kid. So your little kid will train this AI model for my little kid, right? That will grow up with it and be his best friend at some level. It's going to be really weird. Yeah. But you can't be afraid of it. You just have to know. Because, I mean, look, we don't, live in, we don't live in the world we were born into. If you think of the year you were born and the technological levels of that year, it was nothing. Like, your, and your parents and your grandparents, you think about what they went through. Playing TVs, right? I mean, TVs, like, that was a big deal. That was a big deal. And so it's a big deal for us now at a huge level of uncertainty now, won't be. Just like our kids adapt to new technology, and we, you know, it'll go from you know, millennials to Gen Z to Gen AI. It'll be like a whole generation of kids who grew up with friends who were AI. That I was about to say, I mean, you already see some ethics becoming part of everyone's lives now. I've been the time we have left, Mark, you have been, I mean, you always self proclaim you've been very lucky, and you're normal about it. Um, and then you have been very lucky, but you're also really smart. And just full disclosure, you know, I've been email out every single day, I've been doing so for, I don't know, 30 years. And every once in a while, boom, I get email from Mark. He's telling me precisely and exactly what he thinks of what I've written. Yeah, I cherish those emails, but I'm not getting it. Um, because Mark is one of the smartest people, but you're ever likely to meet. So Mark, we're going that much slower. Um, everybody in this room is as confused today as they've ever been. The signals that we're getting from the numbers we usually use to put our finger on the pulse of the economy, uh, trends and trajectory of the doing of life, do not in any way correlate with our lived experience. Most of the, well, everything is going on, most of what's going on right now, See, even the smartest people that I know is highly confusing. And I'm not asking you to be the Oracle of Delphi, and I'm not asking you to, you know, to be the definitive part of the subject. But as you look how in our future, there are little people who would really love to know how we could live them. How, how are you thinking about the near term? What are your hopes? What are your dreams? What are your fears? Um, and without getting too crazy, how are you approaching each day of this incredibly fast thing? I ignore social media, right? I, it's not that I don't use it. I do, but I recognize that social media is not real life. That people take on personas that they use on social media that, you know, you could <laughs> tax her and could be sitting right here on one place, right? You know, who knows, right? I mean, people take on these different personas. And so I'm really optimistic. Like when I look talk to my, my teenagers, right? And I talk to their friends and I see kids who are younger. They're vibrant, they're excited, they're, they're, they're not, you know, they're not downtrodden. They're like, they're looking forward to their future time. There's issues of climate change that everybody's, you know, worried about and with rightfully so. But even there, I think AI and technology, well, so we've got things we have to do, you know, so I'm not panicked about it, but, you know, I, I'm positive. 
I think people are good, right? I think, you know, people say, well, what, what's the one thing you would tell your younger self um, that you would do differently? Yeah, what you know, would you do differently? Do I go from the younger generation, right? Alex King and all that. It's being nice. And you don't really have to tell that to young kids today. They are not. Nice. Now they might be sharply on social media. People are good hearted. And I think that's the beauty of everything that we face here today. Where we got we have all these external pieces of information coming at us. And if you get caught up in it, then it gets scary from time to time. But when I when I see my kids, when I see other kids, I see their friends, you know, I just talk to them. I get excited. And, it, and it's no different than when I was a kid. Just there's always fear. But I'm, I'm dating myself, but I remember, you know, being younger, and there was, you know, there was still a draft for the Vietnam War. And I remember I was a young teenager when they stopped the draft. I remember just crying my eyes all down because I had friends who, you know, older siblings had not come back. And then I remember, you know, being 10 years old, which was, you know, when Martin Luther King and Robert Kennedy Jr. got shot, and thinking, oh my God, there's riots around the country. Are they coming to Pittsburgh where I'm growing up? I remember asking my dad. I remember getting into fights because people called me kikes, this and that. You know, sitting, just sitting down talking about Pittsburgh Pirate baseball, and hearing people just normally use the end That was real life. Like, we don't see that nearly as much. You, no one lived back tonight. You see a multiracial couple or family. Nobody back tonight. People are good hearted. There are so many positive things that are happening in our lives that, you know, the benefit of experience, okay, I can put things in context, context but I, I, I'm positive. Right? I really, really am. And I think, you know, our kids will lead us into places that we may not see yet, and that's a good thing. Ladies and gentlemen, Mark,